Welcome to Caffeinated Splits. I'm Celeste. And I'm Kenzie. We're two chicks who drink coffee and celebrate flicks from diverse directors. If you like what you're hearing so far, take a moment to follow us in your favorite podcasting app. And give us a rating or review. Here's the show. On this very special episode of Caffeine Flicks, unfortunately, Celeste cannot be here, but I have wonderful director, writer, producer of the local Arizona Valley, Parco Richardson. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. (laughs) Parco is an an emerging producer and writer hailing from North Carolina. He grew up as a Jehovah's Witness and Parco's childhood diverged from conventional celebrations, igniting his imaginative spark for crafting unique words of his own. This unconventional upbringing led him to discover his passion for storytelling as an outlet for freedom that he lacked in his religious household, inspiring his journey into the world of media. Your journey into media and film is a little bit different than what you may expect. You graduated high school and then you went straight into the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. So you were in the Marine Corps from 2006 to 2010, serving in Afghanistan and Iraq. And after you got out of the military, you went and you got your degree from the Art Institute of Phoenix Mm -hmm. in 2012. And from there, you have grown from a production assistant to a producer and then using modest budgets to do so and leveraging your experience, you were able to create your own independent filmmaking. And you've successfully raised funds using Kickstarter Mm -hmm. to produce short films such as Alter Valley, Toro de Oro, Mm -hmm. and with Toro de Oro now making waves in the International Film Festival, Mm -hmm. you stand to a testament of resilience, creativity, and unwavering commitment to your craft. Yeah, that sounds about right. (laughs) I'm like, I don't know who wrote it. I assume you did. I mean, I think think it was a little bit of a combination because I I had to like update my bio over to tighten it up. Um, And I think that one particular might have been something that we we wrote for... um, a film contest that I was oh, doing fine. and I just liked it and I was like, all right, let me just keep this and it's going to be like my general <laughs> bio that I use everywhere. <laughs> um, because speaking on that, like I wrote a movie called Black Santa. Yeah, speaking of Christmas, I wrote right? a movie called Black Santa, <laughs> which had got landed me some some Hallmark conversation. They wanted to buy it and things mm-hmm. like that, but they told me it was too big budget. Like they were like, what? What? Hallmark is one of those, they make movie mm-hmm. movies that are in the Half a million to probably their max is maybe two to three billion dollars. Oh, okay. But one thing I didn't realize about Hallmark was that they're one of the, they're in the top five of just channels in the world. So mm-hmm. many people watch Hallmark movies. And I was yeah. like, hmm, I didn't really realize that Hallmark was just such a big brand. Just because there's a lot of people who just stay at home, keep it on in the background, and then it's just going. So, yeah. And Hallmark makes a lot of them. Holiday films. Yeah. <laughs> so that was yeah. why. And that's why they were like, hey, let's talk about this Black Santa. But they didn't <laughs> want to buy it. That's the, that's pretty much the, mm-hmm. the end of it. Not, um, but they did offer me a, a writing position in, in terms of, like, hey, if you have any more holiday films that are within our, or any type of film, like mm-hmm. that are within our wheelhouse and within our budget range, feel free to just send them over. And I was like, are you guys going to pay me or do I, should I do this pro bono? And then it, was, it felt more of the, you just send us what you have and we'll take a look. And I was like, all right, cool. So. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. As you mentioned, Hallmark is such a big thing. I feel like there are two camps of Hallmark movies. You have your sappy Hallmark movies that are just year round. And then yeah. there are a huge swath of people who just tune in for the holiday Hallmark yeah. movie. Mm-hmm. So all of your Christmas movies, like they basically have set up the, Christmas romance genre, if you will, mm-hmm. and how yeah. sappy and silly those are. So, yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. So, thanks for being here. And, you know, we had some coffee today. So, yes. tell me more about your thoughts on the coffee and then it, your preferred coffee. I know that we talked yeah. about it a little bit ago. Yeah, this coffee right here, you said it's from Seattle, mm-hmm. but it, I'm, I'm, I'm drinking it and it feels very strong. I'm like, feel like I'm like <laughs> super wired right now. Oh, uh, that might be Richard. Oh, okay. I'm like, he brews a strong pot. Okay, because I'm sitting here like, <laughs> all right, I'm awake now. Like, <laughs> so, and it, and you're in the, and then the non dairy creamer in there was mm-hmm. it's fantastic. I love it. I'm enjoying it. But I normally drink is mud water. Mm-hmm. I like just gradual, just 
wake you wake me up without the kind of like on edge feeling like i just took a adderall and i'm like ah, you know what i mean that's the what i usually get from when i'm drinking like really strong pots of coffee where i'm just like huh, where's that i I hear color. Yeah, I hear color. I see everything. Oh my god! Like you know, I see music. <laughs> yeah, I hear color. You know, I feel like the dog from uh, is it up? Is it yeah, that's <laughs> Yeah, I'm Kevin. Yeah, I'm Kevin. yeah, I'm Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, I also have not mud water specifically, but I think it's called Rise, which oh, yeah. is another mushroom coffee, and I like that like intermittent with my regular coffee. I'm yeah. just like, okay, I'll have rice first and then i'll have an actual cup of coffee and then i'll pretty much be done for the day but <laughs> it's, it's funny that you say that because i've been getting these targeted ads yes. for that and it's like, now that you said it and yeah. my phone's here i am going to get even more targeted ads i'm going to open my phone and it's going to be a rise i'm like here we go it's all over again like mm -hmm. i've been like how do they know and they're like do you feel like your gut is inflamed and this right. and that you're fatigued and this and that and i'm like how do you know me so well? No, just... <laughs> oh my. And then like, of course, if you wanted to go into that realm, you've also got like athletic greens too. Oh like, yeah. yeah. Oh my God. That's a whole other right. thing. I looked up athletic greens one time. Yeah. And then the ass just went. <laughs> and I was just like, guys, I, I just, I was just wanting to see some information. I was curious. I wanted to know a little bit more, but not all of this. Yeah, exactly. And like, and then it's like all the influencers who are like trying to sell it. They yeah. got codes and this and that. And I'm just yeah. like, guys, I just, this, somebody give me a review of how much they really like this thing. And then yeah. finally, my partner, she basically had a person she works with give her a athletic greens for free. So we were able to oh, try nice. it at home mm -hmm. without spending the money on it. And we enjoyed it, but we were like, mm, I don't know if we're going to spend like the $90 that right. it costs or whatever. So I just go to the Amazon <laughs> green <laughs> greens scoop and I was like, this is 20 bucks. So I do use athletic greens. Oh, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Someone's bougie over here. <laughs> <laughs> athletic Greens, yeah. if you want to sponsor, yeah. by all means. Yeah. But no, I love Athletic Greens, and I find that it is one of the only like greens that doesn't taste bad, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Yeah. And it's funny because the $90 sticker price really is shocking, but mm -hmm. I always think about it like, okay, I'm not buying any other multivitamins now mm -hmm. or any other vitamins that supplement the multivitamins because the multivitamins don't do everything I need them to. Okay, if you're using it like that, then I will stuff that like, <laughs> so yeah, 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 because there's a gnc right down the street and gnc used to be my favorite store we'd go there i would buy everything i'd buy like creatine i'd buy protein powder mm -hmm. i'd buy all of the different supplements mm -hmm. and vitamins yeah. it's all the things and so now i'm like okay I cut it down to athletic green that's pretty much my, <laughs> my so my morning is the mud water mm -hmm. and then i'll do a smoothie but sometimes i do it like where i pack this smoothie with mud water mm -hmm. athletic greens or some type of green powder uh collagen yeah and then i do protein powder and then it's milk and, and frozen uh vegetables and then that's and a banana and then oh <laughs> you always and, have to have the banana and I the banana's have the, banana. the only thing that really matters exactly and then i do also a scoop of peanut butter uh yes. of the, i have powdered peanut butter yeah, powder yep. peanut butter i have that it, too and then there you go <laughs> blend that bad boy up and i'm like all right this is the awake milkshake so i'm just like i'm here you're like this is all i need for the entire day exactly yeah. <laughs> anything else is just a bonus yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's like my whole thing is like waking up to doing that and um, so i'm excited uh when i have a kitchen again because i'm in the middle of a remodel so once yeah. i have that kitchen I'm, I'm ready to get back on my smoothie train dude <laughs> i don't know what i would do without my kitchen my kitchen is i have my studio here mm -hmm. and i have all my painting stuff and my kitchen is like on par with that and it's yeah. like my kitchen and my painting, those are the two things in my life that matter most to me. <laughs> so I'm like, I don't know what I would do without it. That's the heart of the home. <laughs> right? Uh, I feel like my kitchen's not big enough. Everybody keeps telling me that I need a bigger kitchen. I'm like, I know, yeah. but I'm renting. Like, I can't do anything about this. Yeah. We just made our, we just knocked down a wall in our house. So we're, we got awesome. a bigger kitchen now. So. That's <laughs> awesome. Well, congrats on that. Thank you. Today for our episode that's coming out the day after christmas we are talking about a very notorious christmas movie die hard so you brought this to me you were like i want to talk about this so tell me more about your history with the movie i think i think it goes back to that whole childhood growing up religious mm -hmm. and, uh, it's just basically finding movies that weren't typically christmas movies mm -hmm. they say merry christmas right. a lot in this movie oh, <laughs> like all over, the all, place. all over the place and i mean like they're like merry christmas uh, 
I think there should be a count for every time they say it. All right, this they say Merry Christmas at least three times in a movie. Right. That's a Christmas movie. It's fucking Christmas, baby. Right. Yeah. I'll tell you what. <laughs> to be fair, this movie also takes place on Christmas, Christmas Eve. Eve. Yep. And they're at a Christmas party. Yep. And there's Christmas music. Yeah. They're, they say Merry Christmas. Mm -hmm. Everything is centered around the gift and the joy of Christmas. Exactly. Whether or not you're taking it by storm on your own or you yeah. have to fight for it. But and, and speaking <laughs> of which, who has like a corporate party like on the, christmas, christmas eve. eve i was just like thinking about this i'm like watching this movie i'm like okay usually most christmas parties are like a couple weeks beforehand mm -hmm. but not like the night of christmas eve and i think that was a an iconically 80s thing mm -hmm. because if you think about other 80s christmas movies mm -hmm. all of the holiday parties happened on christmas eve or mm -hmm. on christmas day have you ever seen christmas. scrooged with Bill Murray. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. okay so they don't actually have a party per se, uh -huh. but everything happens on Christmas Eve mm -hmm. and then Christmas Day. Yeah. The whole thing. Yeah. It's all centered on those two days. Yeah. <laughs> and it, you you would think, especially for a movie like this, I was just also thinking, I'm like, man, they got a lot of people working mm -hmm. on Christmas Eve. Like, I'm like, they were able to mobilize the SWAT units, helicopters, <laughs> all of this stuff. <laughs> FBI. The FBI. And it's so funny. And when I think about all the people who are, these are the people who are like got in trouble or something. Mm -hmm. Like those are people who have to work the holidays. Usually the people, usually the people who work holidays are like, the or first. they're less senior in rank. Yeah, yeah. So it's like less their senior. first year, yeah, their exactly. second year. Uh -huh. <laughs> like when the police captain is out there, I'm like, I don't think the police captain would even be out there all Christmas Eve. He would just be like, who's the junior guy that? Send him. Yeah. I'm spending time with my family. Either. Well, and I think that's probably what it was at first. Mm -hmm. But then they're like, oh, there are terrorists. Yeah. We have to get in on this. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's a big deal. We yeah. need to be able to say we figured out the problem or that me as the assistant chief figured out the problem and made it all right. Yeah. Like In the movie that they say, hey, I'm going to lose my job over this. It's Christmas right. Eve. It's Christmas Eve. But I'm like. Man, there's a lot of people just able to mobilize very quickly in this movie <laughs> for and within a little small window. Everything takes right. place within like maybe four or five hours at most. Yeah. So it's like they were able to be like, boom, getting things done. So I'm just like helicopter this and that. I'm like, cool. I wish people moved that fast these days because now it's just hard to get somebody on customer service. It's 30 minute right. wait where you're trying to talk to somebody. Oh, uh, right. Oh my gosh. <laughs> cool. So shall we get into the movie then? Yeah. Okay. So this movie was directed by John McTiernan. And I don't know if you've seen the Netflix show, The Movies That Made Us. Mm. So they interviewed John McTiernan and a couple of other people who worked on the movie itself. And they said that John McTiernan turned down this movie probably four or five times. Wow. That's interesting. <laughs> he didn't want to do it. <laughs> but he finally caved in. So a little bit about John McTiernan. He was born on January 8th in Albany, New York. He's the director and producer known for Die Hard, Rollerball, and Last Action Hero. He often shows characters speaking in foreign languages, but they're unsubtitled. Yeah. According to McTiernan, this is a habit that comes from the countless foreign films that he saw as a student. A lot of his films feature late lens flare, including Die Hard. As somebody who does directing and mm -hmm. filming and stuff like that can you describe what a lens flare is so a lens flare is basically you're allowing a little bit of light like a light source to peek into the lens creating oh. this kind of halo effect in there and so there's a lot of different tricks and things that people do to enhance that there's this like crystal ball that they would like on a like stick it looks like a like rock candy oh and sometimes gosh. you could put they'll put that in front of the lens and it's hitting the light is hitting that and mm -hmm. it's sparkling and it's doing and it's so uh, there's a lot of cool things with lens flare but you know if you watch jj abram movies and things mm -hmm. like that they're starting to now just you can add lens flare mm -hmm. after you've shot in the movie in so editing, that yeah, yeah. editing and post and so now you don't even have to use the light source anymore and do it practically in camera now they're just like oh, there's this vis effects thing that we can just add and oh, that creates a... Because if you don't like it, mm -hmm. like, you don't you have to... Really, you can take it away. Yeah. So I think that's also another reason why they stopped probably doing a lot of things in camera. But I think that also loses a little bit of the magic and mm -hmm. things of why we love these classic movies too versus now where we keep hearing in Hollywood, oh, superhero fatigue and right. fatigue and IP fatigue, all these different things that I think is because we're losing that originality mm -hmm. of things and 
So even just like practical effects versus yeah. special effects. Yeah. Just mm-hmm. like especially when you've got anything older than I think two thousand, everything mm-hmm. had to be practical effects because it just wasn't necessarily the technology to make like CGI worlds yeah. out of it. Um I that mean, you could see on screen. Yeah. I'm watching Fantastic Four last night <laughs> and I'm like and then I, and I watched the new version, the one that was in 2015, and the old version, and the thing in the new one is CG, but the old one, the one, you know, we grew up in 2005, is practical mm-hmm. suit. He's in the suit. Yeah. And I'm like, man, you cannot probably get away with that suit today. Like, you know, <laughs> and now they would just probably have a bunch of stickers on them, just like with Mark Ruffalo. Right. It's like the whole, you just have them in a green suit and just have these dots around them. And <laughs> there it is. And even with all the suits, like mm-hmm. Spider-Man suits, they, I mean, they, are, they're, they make practical suits. But if you look at any of the BTS, they're made, they're just in these like spandex that, and that's it. And they and then they CG all of the suits on them, onto them now. Wow! And that's probably a way to keep all a lot of the budget down too. They don't have to spend a lot of the money on mm-hmm. like these these functioning suits that they can right. have to do all this combat. Like all in. the special fabric, yeah. having to tear it, having mm-hmm. to make several suits because exactly. you have to have it in different stages. Mm-hmm. How cool! Yeah. But also, John, he did make a movie that I really enjoyed. Which one? Last Action Hero. Oh, okay. Yeah, I love that film. (laughs) I will have to look that one up. I haven't actually watched that one. So, for you being a movie buff, Mm -hmm. it is literally it's meta. It's before ahead of its time, and it's about a kid who gets this golden ticket Mm -hmm. that allows him to enter the movie burst, and so he enters his favorite action hero, which is Arnold Schwarzenegger. But Arnold Schwarzenegger is playing him. Basically, there's two versions. So he plays the the version of the character in the movie but then when he's in the real world he's Arnold Schwarzenegger so it's that like, it's this very meta movie <laughs> and it's really well done it's probably one of my favorite uh, action movies out there because mm-hmm. when you're in the when you're actually in the movie world it's just every cliche literally just and it's so funny because there's a there's a point where they go to a blockbuster and they're like look there's a poster of you oh and it's <laughs> Sylvester Stallone who plays the Terminator <laughs> instead of him and then his character, Arnold Schwarzenegger's character is, oh my God, this is Stallone's best movie. This is the best. I like this meta thing. It is. Oh, it's so great. Oh, it's so funny. That is awesome. Yeah. I will have to watch yeah. that. So in Die Hard, speaking of Arnold Schwarzenegger was one of the first people that they asked to play Bruce Willis's character, mm-hmm. but he turned it down. Chuck Norris turned it down. Clint Eastwood turned it down. Mm-hmm. So many people turned it down. But Bruce Willis was a TV rom-com star mm-hmm. and he wanted to break into films and so his agent was a very good agent and he got him on screen and he ended up getting him a five million dollar fee mm-hmm. for this movie making wow. him the highest paid actor at that time wow it was something completely unheard of especially for somebody who had not actually been a movie star yeah. at that time so it definitely made him a movie star <laughs> it <man>. definitely <laughs> did solid movie solid work <laughs> <laughs> and then speaking of people who had never done movies before this is also where Alan Rickman enters the scene mm-hmm. because Alan Rickman was a Broadway actor. Mm-hmm. And so he had never done film before, but the casting director knew of him and was like, okay, we have to have Alan Rickman mm-hmm. on here. And I'm so glad that they did because Alan Rickman is incredible. Yeah. I was watching it last night and there's just things about it in his performance that feel very theatrical to me. Yes. Like he's very like where he's just like, what if he alters the plant? And then his eyes do this. <laughs> You know he's what I mean? Expressive. Yeah, yeah. Very expressive yeah. because when you're on stage, you have to be you overly to be, expressive yeah. because you're like mm-hmm. projecting to yeah. hundreds of people on yeah. So when he's like doing these like things, I'm like, oh man, that's such an interesting choice that you just mm-hmm. did there. It worked. <laughs> I will say the only thing that he doesn't do well in this movie are the accents. Oh yeah. He, he can't was... he can't do a German accent, he can't do an American accent. Mm-hmm. But oh. yeah, I mean his regular he fades in and out of accents yeah. like it's hilarious. Yeah. But otherwise absolutely phenomenal yep. mm-hmm. <laughs> so we've got bonnie bedelia who mm-hmm. plays holly Gennaro mclean yep. we got reggie bell johnson who plays sergeant al powell oh, yeah. and this Mr. was Winslow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this was um actually he said in the movies that made us that he was about to give up on acting and he mm-hmm. came out and he i'm trying to remember what the word is Audition? Audition, yes. I was going to say applied, and I was like, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah. He auditioned for this role, and he was like, if I don't get it, this is it. But he got it, nice. even though Wesley Snipes was actually auditioning for the same role. Oh, wow. But <laughs> he, Which would have been such a weird choice for Wesley. Weird and, and, and it wasn't like Wesley, it like, it ain't like his character mm-hmm. did anything. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I don't think Wesley Snipes, I think if Wesley Snipes would have got hired for this part, 
that character probably would have ended up in the building somehow. Yeah, yeah. definitely. <laughs> yeah. definitely. Yeah. Or it would have been like, there's a lot of comedy in this movie, mm -hmm. but Al's role doesn't really have a whole lot of comedy. Mm -hmm. And Wesley Snipes is a really great comedic actor. Mm. And so I feel like it probably either would have gone straight action yeah. or straight comedy. And it would have been like the blend that it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> In addition to our star-studded cast, we've also got Paul Gleason. I'm going to screw up his name because I he said it and it's a very different name. Devereaux. I don't know. He, I think he said that's not actually how you pronounce it. Mm. But <laughs> Is it Argyle? Uh, Yes, yeah, Argyle. Argyle, yeah. Uh, Devereaux White, mm -hmm. William Arthurton, mm -hmm. uh, Hart Bachner, mm -hmm. James Shigeta, uh, Alexander Gunov, Godunov, Gna I am <laughs> so bad at names sometimes, and Clarence Gilliard Jr., and several others. Because if you've never seen this movie before, there's at least like a dozen German henchmen who <laughs> all look exactly the same so that's really all you need to know <laughs> yeah so now we're getting into our ratings as i mentioned we have a 10 out of 10 rating and a 1 out of 10 rating mm -hmm. do you have a preference as to which one you want to read let's see all right let's see the iconic action 10 out of 10 the ultimate combination of action crime and christmas <laughs> die hard is timeless in its appeal Willis is perfect casting in his most iconic role as McClane. And Rickman, the faultless foil as the, the, what's the really iconic Hans Gruber. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not only is the action explosive and pulsating, but the wider cast of characters also gets some form of an arc, fleshing them out. Dialogue is great, even if the German may not may be a bit off which is like the german might be I, how would you know that <laughs> so, so, it's ellen rickman's fat accent yeah yeah <laughs> but i mean the words that they're saying yes. all the time they're like yeah. talking this and i'm like waiting i like put the subtitles on mm -hmm. the what yeah, it doesn't that, it doesn't even yeah it doesn't even say anything say, yeah yeah and the setting never tries despite being restricted to within a single building Big budget, all out action, and perfect one lighters, all in one <laughs> festive present. Me personally, yes, that is a great. Yeah. That's ten out of ten. Iconic. It is iconic action. Yeah. It set the. I think it set the bar for all other action movies afterwards. Mm -hmm. I don't. Oh yeah. yeah, they say all the time. After this movie, they had Die Hard on a bus, mm -hmm. Die Hard on a train, yeah, Die exactly. Hard in yeah. the White House. Yeah. Everything was Die yeah. Hard. This really set the precedent for action yeah. movies going forward. Exactly. So you've seen Scrooge. Yep. We just talked yep. about it. Do you remember at the very beginning of Scrooge, they're putting together this dark, violent, scary version of A Christmas Carol. Mm -hmm. And then there's the voiceover of the guy reading out The Christmas Carol. Uh, I, I haven't seen Scrooge in forever. So that's okay. the thing. I need to watch. You watch do. That. Yes. You need to watch this movie because the way that you read that 10 out of 10 yeah. sounded just like the guy who's doing oh, the voiceover. <laughs> Oh, yeah. 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 No, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was so funny. I was just like, that is perfect. Iconic <laughs> Christmas movie voiceover. Got it. <laughs> so one out of 10, overrated, interminable, and has not aged well. Boring, interminable, and more talk than action. I remember enjoying this film when I first saw it as a teenager, but it has not aged well. The beginning is too slow, and it takes too long for anything exciting to get started. Whenever there's any action... There are too many interruptions that were probably meant to be funny, but are just annoying, unnecessary, and interrupt the flow of action. The action is mostly guns, explosives, and destruction. Typically a big budget movie, Hollywood action movies of that era. As someone who had gotten used to the faster paced Hong Kong action films of the 90s, which had silly plots, but at least some nonstop action and incredible fight choreography and stunts that you didn't see in Hollywood movies at the time. This one was simply somniferous. <laughs> I've never seen this word before. Well, yeah, I don't know. No. All right, <laughs> somniferous. I'm going to have to Google that later. Not even Alan Rickman could save this movie for me, but at least he made a good villain. Uh, so I give this one star. I <laughs> People like that. I don't know. I don't get it. Oh, well, hold on. first of all, where did you coil these from? Like, I am to be. I am to be. Okay. Yeah. 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 I, you know what? It, it's funny because. 
He's talking about the 90s action movies. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, most of those had zero plot, zero story. Right. It, it's all just, it is just fighting, fighting. and you blowing just, you're up. There, yeah, you're there for the fighting. Yes. Like, you know, yeah. you, you look at Rumble in the Bronx and you're just like, you, I'm not there for the story of that. The story <laughs> sucks. But I'm there for Jackie Chan, uh, who's mm -hmm. literally doing all his crazy stunts. If you're looking for a good Jackie Chan movie that has some story, go watch Police Story. But anything, <laughs> but if you're just there right. for just to have some turn it off and let's see him fight and do some crazy things, mm -hmm. go watch his night. Go watch Jackie Chan's '90s things. There's some few. There's a few movies in there like First Strike that are like the continuation of the Police Story that are right. like that have story. But who am I? It's such a far fetched story. It's like a guy. He's on a special <laughs> forces. Bumps his head. He gets raised. It's like he ends up in Africa. He's somewhere in South Africa. Gets raised by a tribe in Africa. Forgets how to speak within two weeks. <laughs> of I'm like. <laughs> and like nobody what like it's just this whole weird thing it's just like there's this di i don't know it's just like, the, the plot is all over the place and he's mixed up in all this weird it's it's so crazy and just all over the place but i'm not there for that i'm there to see jack chen jump off this building and all right. in, the, in the trailer they're not talking about the plot they're talking about they're showing you all the action and nuts and things like this i don't know yeah you know i mean this like, guy so we did a point break probably mm. a couple months ago yeah. or something like that so dumb but i love it so much mm -hmm. it's so funny it's just so good in so many ways yeah but it's that same dumb action movie and sometimes you just need that yeah, in your you life need it. that's all we need it's mindless action like, people are like people who are not john wick they're like oh my god there's too I much know. killing it's too much. i'm like guys <laughs> speaking of keanu reeves. Yeah, keanu reeves i'm like guys, it's just mindless but it's just fun like it's just yeah. i'm here for entertainment like yep. You, and you're not supposed to want anything else mm -hmm. out of that. Like, if you're there to be like challenged mentally from it, mm -hmm. you're in the wrong spot. You're right. in the wrong space. You have to know what you're watching. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like I'm there just to be eating some popcorn and having a chit chat and being like, whoa, this is amazing. <laughs> he's doing his stuff and he's like mm -hmm. perfectly reloading the gun. Right. And that's what Which makes Keanu Reeves actually does. Yeah, he does like, all this He stuff. does all of his own stunts. He now knows how to surf because of Point Break. Yeah. Break. And he does all of his own stunts in all of the John Wick movies in The Matrix. He's done all of his own shit because he's like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this look real. Mm -hmm. And that is what he gives us. And so the least we can do is sit and enjoy. Yeah. And it's funny that like, he's in two of the biggest kind of franchisee type movies. Mm -hmm. Like The Matrix was, man, I, like, I think about The Matrix now and I'm like, if they would have just waited just to yeah. make that ma the Matrix one now, like it would just be like, people would be like, oh, like, my God, I'm just waiting I don't want them to remake it though. That's like what I, you, so that's what I'm about to get at. Saying. Yeah, like, I'm I'm getting to the point where I'm waiting and waiting for them to be like, all right, which franchise are we going? Remember when they were trying to reboot all of the '90s mm -hmm. franchise, like oh, Total Recall, and yeah, they, they were just trying to like Judge Dread, like they were mm -hmm. trying to re revamp Robocop, like, Robocop, <laughs> and then they just never caught on, and they just died at those one movies. Mm -hmm. But I'm just like, okay, are they going to end up? Because I feel like they're going to end up remaking like, Back to the Day. Right. Or they're gonna like end up remaking Indiana Jones. I know they're yeah. gonna end up rebooting those franchises. Yeah. Like when Which we're makes like me so sad. Yeah, no, but I know they're gonna do it like when we're like 50, 60 years old. I don't know. Be, like... They're remaking Mean Girls, and Mean Girls oh, came out yeah. in the two thousands. That's true. <laughs> I just remember that. That's, and that's actually coming out pretty recently. Yes, anyway. it's coming out really soon. Anyway. I don't know. <laughs> Oh, so I could go down this like yeah. deep rabbit hole with you. Yeah. Um, but uh, shall we get into our movie now? It is. All right. right. Awesome possum. And in case you forgot already, we're doing Die Hard. Die Hard. <laughs> yeah, sorry, guys. <laughs> I always think of one more aside, I swear, before we really start. I always think of Friends. Mm. And when Joey Chandler and Ross mm. are watching their Die Hard marathon, mm. they're just like, Die Hard! Oh, streaming it? Yeah, <laughs> Die Hard! <laughs> Oh, and what's even funnier is that I realized that Bruce Willis is a guest star in Friends oh, later yeah, that's on. Right. He plays and... one of the boyfriends or something like that. <laughs> yes, he plays Rachel's boyfriend, who is Ross's girlfriend's dad. <laughs> that's, that's way too much for me. <laughs> I've watched Friends way too many I know. times. I'm like so... thinking of like how many Friends episodes have I actually? Oh my watched? gosh! The only '90s show that I'm really like have been watching mm -hmm. recently is Seinfeld, which is oh yeah, surprisingly just really hilarious like i'm just like because it's just everyday stuff that we, that has just been mm -hmm. amplified into these co like comedic aspects i'm like oh that's a funny way funny take on it mm -hmm. funny take on this and, yeah 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 cool so back to the movie, yeah, back <laughs> so, to the movie. <laughs> we open up the movie with a plane landing and we see our protagonist john mcclain played by bruce willis mm -hmm. and he is a very nervous flyer 
but he <laughs> is luckily landed. Yeah. Um, but the guy next to him decides that once they are safely on the ground, that this is the time to give him the advice of how to relax from a plane flight. Yeah. Versus being like mid flight, right. flight from New York, four hour flight. <laughs> I know. Like New York to LA yeah. is at least eight to 10 hours, mm -hmm. depending. Because I know that like I have to go to New York sometimes for work. Yeah. And from here in Phoenix, yeah. it is eight hours. Oh, wow. Like with a layover. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But okay. So the eight hours is not including the layover. Oh, yeah. That is just pure flight time. Pure flight time. Sometimes it takes like 10 hours to get there oh. because of the layover. Yeah, yeah. But the pure flight time is eight hours. Yeah. And it generally is that way. <laughs> yeah. That's so ridiculous. I mean, like. I, yeah, I just, yeah, found it like that whole plot line at the beginning where it's just like you ball your, uh, you know, you ball your feet up and make fist and everything. And make I'm a just, fist with your toes. Just, and I'm like, okay, this guy, 11 years on the police force, hates to fly, but then he decides he's going to take on a whole building of terrorists and do all of this craziness. <laughs> and when I jump off buildings, do this, and I'm right. like, and you're telling me you're just, you're in a box. <laughs> but you know what? When you don't have real control over yeah. like something, an aspect, you, I can understand that. Yeah. Actually. A lot of people are afraid of flying. I'm not making fun of anybody yeah, yeah. who's afraid of flying. I, I can't even imagine. Yeah. But just the fact that the guy sitting next to him decides touchdown, <laughs> that this is the point to give him sage advice that once you're done, in order to relax and refresh from your plane flight, take off your shoes, make fists with your toes in the carpet and feel the ground that's the moment to tell him that yeah. i'm like really yeah. really that, not that with the one take off or anything like yeah. that and i like because yeah, i'm sure he was like oh, yeah the whole like scene. Yeah. pounding yeah. those mini bottles of yeah, alcohol yeah i know he was wasted <laughs> right? he had, john had to be drunk <laughs> had you know to be. I mean? he had to be drunk this then he had to be drunk on the flight he was smoking he was constantly smoking well, you know what? <laughs> and also what a wonderful time like back then like he boarded a plane with his gun he's smoking on the airplane he's smoking in the <laughs> airport <laughs> You know what I mean? He, yeah, they're doing so yeah. much things. I'm like, so many things. I'm like, that's how that, you know it's pre 9 11. Yeah, pre 9 11. And I'm like, <laughs> they just let officers just, they got through security. I don't even know if they had security. Oh, yeah. Who, who <laughs> knows that they had TSA back then? You know what I mean? It's the 80s. <laughs> yeah, he just like had his gun. You know what I mean? I'm surprised there weren't more incidents <laughs> that like, and that's probably why people think now is like, they probably just watch Die Hard and they're like, John McClane got on a plane with a gun. Yeah. I, I can get on a plane with a gun. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see the issue. I don't, I don't see the issues. Issue. Yeah. Oh, boy. So he eventually gets off the plane, and we cut to an office party at a corporation where the CEO of the Los Angeles Nakatomi Corporation is congratulating all of his staff at their Christmas Eve party for making it another great year at Nakatomi. Record profits. Record profits. Rob, record profits. Sounds pretty familiar. <laughs> <laughs> Corporate greed, guys. <laughs> well, and then, so I was listening to another recap of this movie, and they talk about the, this is still a time in U.S. history where people are cautious about Japanese people. Mm. So a lot of that is still stemmed in this movie. Mm. But unless you know that, it doesn't read. Yeah. I completely forgot about that. Yeah, me too. And, but this is a, a Japanese company. Mm -hmm. The CEO is Japanese. And like just some of the commentary that's made between them, it's a little bit different. Like at one point in time, John tells him like, oh, I didn't know that you guys in Japan celebrated Christmas. Oh, yeah, so yeah. like those kinds of things. Well, it's funny you say that because we just had a, a, a friend from Japan come in. We had uh, oh, cool. lunch with her and she basically told us the same thing like in japan mm -hmm. they work on christmas mm -hmm. they don't they don't celebrate it at all they just it's a very busy day for them and yeah, yeah it's just it, very, christmas is a very western holiday yeah, yeah. that totally makes sense yeah. that totally tracks and you think about just the human migration and religious migration yeah so on and so forth but anyway still back at this office party we've got one woman who's still working she's trying to make some deadlines yeah. she's made this huge deal and her name is holly mm -hmm. she is the wife the estranged wife of our protagonist john mclean while she's walking down this hallway she's trying to get to her office and a complete tool of a man comes over to her tries and hits on her and is hey why don't we go to dinner and she's like I can't no thank you we're good and she tells him to eventually buzz off yeah. so and this man is like the he is the, the stereotype yeah and, and he's like the stereotype of like the 80s just like coked out 
Yes. Executive. It's just the sales executive of some executive. sort. Yeah. Like this dude is a salesman through and through. Yeah. But his title is not sales somehow. Like mm-hmm. I think his title is like marketing. And I'm just like, <laughs> dude, you are a salesman. Yeah, like, exactly. I can see straight through you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so Holly tells him to buzz off. She gets into her office and she calls home. She talks to one of her children. She's got a boy and a girl. And so she talks to her little girl. Her little girl's like maybe six. Yes. And I think her son's like maybe four. And she asks her to put their housekeeper on. And she tells the housekeeper, can you please make sure to have the guest room made up for if John decides to come and stay? Apparently, he's flying from New York to L.A. Mm -hmm. to spend Christmas with his family, even though they're estranged. And they have been for about six months now. And... Back at the airport, we see that John meets up with his ride, a limo driver named Argyle. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely love this interaction Mm -hmm. because Argyle's like, okay, well, what do we do now? And John's (laughs) like, I don't know. What do we do now? You're the guy. You're the limo driver. And Argyle's like, this is my first day as a limo driver. So let's just do this together. (laughs) And I just want to talk about John Mm -hmm. and his presence. He only brought this giant teddy bear. (laughs) All right. You have two kids right now. Oh, they're just supposed to split. Yeah, you're supposed to cut this <laughs> bear in half. Who gets that bear? You know what I mean? You know what? They, they trade off days. They trade off days. I'm they like, trade off I days. think a prop would have been bad. I don't, because, you know, I think really that bear is for comedic relief. You see it down the line. But I really, if it was me making this movie, I would have had him have like a couple of presents. Right. You know what I mean? Exactly. Like, that's what would have been like the idea. But like, just to have one giant bear right and it's just that's it and it's like who are you giving that to i wish kid <laughs> you know what i think it's actually for his wife i don't think uh-huh. he got any presents for his kids he just but then why did he didn't bring wife. it into the building he didn't no well, he left it into the limo yeah. i mean you gotta because you gotta make sure it's a surprise oh, for yeah, for day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's true that is true <laughs> so in the limo john's never ridden in a, in a limo before so he sits up front yeah and Argyle is confused by this, but Argyle lets him know that he used to be a cab driver. Mm-hmm. And so Argyle does the very cab driver thing and asks a thousand questions. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so during this interlude, we find out that John is married and that his wife has been living out in LA for six months. She was originally supposed to be out here just for a good job, but that turned into a really great career. Mm-hmm. And he didn't come because he's a New York City cop with six months of backlog. Yeah. So that was his excuse. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> so they pull up to this very tall building which is the Nakatomi Tower. And Argyle tells John, you know what? I'm going to wait for you. You told me that you and your wife are iffy. Mm-hmm. So if she invites you to come stay, I'll leave. But if she doesn't and you need someplace else to go, let me call down. I got my car phone here, which was very popular in the 80s yeah. as well. And I will take you to wherever you need to go. And so that's how we get Argyle stuck in the garage parking lot for <laughs> hours on end. Even if he did, have to say hey everything's good john your stuff is still in the car because mm. <laughs> he didn't bring it up to the building <laughs> that is so true that is so true like he would have had to go back down anyway to get his stuff in so it wouldn't like have been this simple hey see you later you know right. I mean? like, and, and for me if i was argyle you have a phone in your car right i would have just left like you know, like me i would i'd have been like why do i need to be like in the building like i would just like, mm-hmm. hey, I'm going to go grab a quick bite to eat right. or something like that. Like, I'm thinking of Argyle's time frame where I'm like, okay, he's been there the entire time just sitting in the car. I'm like, hopefully that man had snacks and some Dude. drinks and stuff like that. <laughs> like, this guy was living it up in yeah. the backseat. He's yeah. calling every booty call he's ever had. Yeah. And uh-huh. he is he's like, yeah, I'm coming partying out. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, oh, I don't know how long this is going to be, but I'll be over there later. Yeah, I know, right? He's like, boss, thinks I'm going to Vegas. I'm like, going to Vegas on Christmas Eve? <laughs> Like, what if you're gonna pick yeah, it up? I mean, for real, like, his boss should be like, All right, tomorrow's Christmas, like, right? Why am I? He shouldn't be picking up anybody, but anyway, <laughs> I don't know. Have you ever met rich people? They like to do wild that, things, that's true. That's true. That's true. Very true. <laughs> John goes into the building and he tries to find Holly's name in their database and realizes that she's changed her last name to her maiden name, mm-hmm. Holly Gennaro. And I do have to comment that in this list of names, mm-hmm. the name right below Gennaro is Gafella. <laughs> and I was like, what the fuck kind of name is Gefeller? <laughs> I don't even know how to say that. That's just my yeah guess. But I'm just, I was so struck by that. I was like, what the fuck is Gefeller? I think they just typed in letters. And they're yeah. like, this has to make sense just alphabetically. Yeah. <laughs> so John heads up to the 30th floor. One quick note from mm-hmm. that. When he's on his way to the elevator, 
they imply that one of these guards might be in on it. Yeah. Because there's this guy, he's just sitting there playing with his fingertips and <laughs> doing some weird stuff. And he's John, weird security. Yeah, yeah, he's just leaning on the wall and he's doing, and John looks over at him and he just kind of gives him the up and down and then he's just like pushes the thing and the guy's just sitting there. But this guy gets killed. He, I don't, he, he yeah. doesn't make it. And I'm like, yeah. so why? Like, they just gave this hint of like, maybe he like, told like mm-hmm. you know maybe he was the inside man yeah that like maybe get but then like obviously they're like we don't we can't no loose ends yeah, like, no you know, loose ends. It's, yeah. <laughs> no, no. um speaking of which when argyle goes and parks in the the garage mm-hmm. i cannot believe that when there's a giant rager of an office party happening upstairs You're the entire up- garage is empty oh yeah there's not a single there's car. not a single car in there's this garage not, nobody's car like did nobody park <laughs> in the garage? Yeah, like, where's everybody's vehicle at? Right. They all worked that day. Yeah, exactly. And, like... <laughs> they all go there at one point, but it's completely empty. It's completely empty. And then, right, and then also, when a terrorist come in, and they're, like, driving all in, nobody saw this limo parked right. there. Nobody right. said, hey, let's check this limo out. Make sure nobody's in there. And it's just... That limos are notoriously inconspicuous, right? Yeah, like, exactly. Nobody yeah. ever realizes yeah. they're there. Yeah. I'm like sitting there like, <laughs> what is going on here? So upstairs, John is wading through the crowd and he is saying hello to people who come up to him and think that he's somebody else. One of the guys comes over and kisses him on the cheek and he's just like, what the fuck? Yeah. L.A., I guess. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the funny thing is, I'm, like I've been starting to think about, okay, what are my some of the people that we like, I guess our movie characters. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. if this was the real world, who would they vote for? And I really <laughs> think that John McClane would be a Trump supporter. There's so many things in his, like, you know, in the way he's like, California. Like, oh right. my God. like, he's like looking at people. He's just like in this whole different world. Every time he's mm-hmm. like, oh my God. Like, you know, he's seeing like the girl, like in the, in the airport, she jumps up on the guy, they're making out in the airport. He's just like, oh, what? And then like, he's just saying thing. And the guy, uh, even Argyle, when he's like, mm-hmm. let's play some Christmas in there playing a run DMC. Yeah, and he's just like, yeah. you got any other music? <laughs> this is not Christmas music. No traditional stuff. Like, he's just saying all these things where I'm just like, He's the make America great type of guy, like, you know, like even in later films, because he yeah. leans into that type of narrative, mm. even in his, the later Die Hard movies, right. where he's just okay. like that grumpy, you know, See, like. <laughs> and I've never seen any of the other Die Hard movies. Oh, okay, I've only so... seen this one. So I'm just like, to me, he looks like somebody who just wouldn't, wouldn't vote. Yeah. Honestly. I mean, he may not vote either. That's another thing. I, and, I, and also, I'm like, you know what? I know one guy who we would all think would vote Republican, but I think would vote Democrat. I think Rambo, because he dealt with police brutality. <laughs> I think he would be all about reform. I think R- Rambo uh, would be like, awesome. "I gotta, I gotta vote Democrat so I can vote for reform." So inside, he finds the CEO Joe Takagi, and we find out that Joe Takagi sent him the limo. Which yeah. I'm not entirely sure how or why. Holly seems surprised that he's there. Yeah, but. Apparently, he was supposed to show up. Okay. I mean, the sign on that. The, I saw it did have yeah. Nakatori, Nakatomi uh, building, whatever, on the, mm-hmm. I don't know, yeah. the watermark on there. <laughs> this is where Joe tells John that there's still construction going on in the, in the building, specifically in the upstairs. They're trying to finish it out. And they walk into Holly's office, and Elias, or Ellis, his name is Ellis. Yeah. I'm going to probably call him Elias because I can't get his name. Yeah. Right. But <laughs> his name is Ellis. He's a complete tool and he's doing coke on Holly's desk. Yeah. <laughs> they walk in and he pretends like he's not doing anything. And then he goes and, you know, introduces himself to John. And John's like, uh, you missed a little. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is where Ellis tells John that this isn't just a holiday party. We just closed this major deal. And a lot of that is in part to your wife, mm-hmm. which makes Ellis even more of a tool. Like yeah. he's asking Holly out for dinner mm-hmm. when he knows straight up that she's got a husband. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just like, come on, let's go out to dinner. It's mm-hmm. Christmas Eve. You've got kids, but let's go out to I dinner. Don't care. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not got kids at home. Oh, what a tool. So John goes and washes up, and this is where Holly and John are catching up with one another. He's taken off. His, his shirt so he's just in this undershirt now and he finally he takes off his shoes and he does the thing that the guy on the plane told him to do mm-hmm. and he's like son of a bitch mm-hmm. this works yeah <laughs> so holly tells him that he's invited to stay in her spare bedroom mm-hmm. and then they start to fight about their marriage and the fact that she's going by her maiden name yeah. he's very unhappy about this mm-hmm. and she tries to explain that in japan 
they look down upon women who mm. are married because they don't think that they're necessarily focused on work then. Yeah. So this is where her assistant comes in and says that Holly has wanted to give a speech. Mm -hmm. And so now we've just got John by himself. Yeah. We see a truck pull into the garage and out comes this gaggle of henchmen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we've got two men who walk inside and shoot both men in the lobby. And then we have Alan Rickman and the gaggle of henchmen just like getting into position, essentially. Yeah. They also then decide to lock down the building so nobody can get in or get out. Mm -hmm. And one of the henchmen takes over as the lobby guy. And he looks exactly like him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was just like, okay, well, at least you're a good fit, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Henchman. Just showing up to this party late, right? <laughs> I'd be like, "Hey, honey, I'll be there later. Don't you worry." And then, like, get there at eight o'clock, and they're like, "Hey, I've got to." <laughs> it's like, "Oh yeah, head up to the thirty yeah, floor. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Good, Good morning. Um, so we've got all of the henchmen in position. You know, they're in the building. They're doing surveillance, and we cut to John and John Carl calls Argyle and says that he's not quite sure that he's in the clear yet. So the henchmen cutting down the power lines, they're cutting into all the security and the surveillance. And this is when the phone call drops from John calling Argyle and eight or nine of the henchmen go up the elevator with a crap ton of guns. Mm -hmm. Once they enter the party, they begin shooting and rounding everybody up. They haven't shot anybody yet, mm -hmm. but they're using scare tactics, yeah. scare tactics to get them all together. But John hasn't been spotted yet, so he makes a getaway to the stairs. He's got his New York City police gun with him, and then he's looking for another phone, but he finds out that all of the phone lines are completely dead. Back at the party, everybody's been round up, and Hans Gruber tells everyone that Nakagami has been greedy and will be taught a lesson in power. So Hans Gruber... They are called terrorists and they play it off as if they are terrorists, but they're really just robbers. Yeah. But they're using it as a facade to hide their motives, if you will. So that'll be a through line throughout the movie as well. Hans Gruber is looking for the CEO, Joe, and he starts reading out his bi biography. And Holly is sitting right next to Joe and says, don't do it. Don't do it, man. Mm -hmm. But Joe stands up and he says that he can't let anybody else take the fall for this. Mm -hmm. And so Hans shakes his hand and a henchman takes him away. Um, I love the overly uh, when Holly when, when they start reading out the bio and Holly like does this really weird like arm grab to him yeah like, and it's like this She's like don't do yeah it. It, it's, but it, she does it like a weird like like she peels like her yeah they are like slow peel like type of thing like <laughs> I'm like why do you just be like <laughs> you know right. don't you dare <laughs> I think it was also to like not cause attention, attention to him yeah yeah not get attention to him. Don't do it. I know what you're thinking. Yeah. I've worked with you for six months. I know. We are, yeah, six months. We're, we're tied it to the hip. I know exactly who you are and what kind of person you are. Do do this. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, this is all happening. John is sleuthing around and slipping past everybody, trying to find a solution, trying to get out of the building, trying to call the police, trying to figure out how is he going to save the day. Mm -hmm. Hans and two of the henchmen take Joe to another floor where there are dioramas of Nakatomi's future expansion plans in different countries. And they're so cute. I tell you. <laughs> they're nice. Yep. So Joe is brought into this room and we've got a computer hacking henchman named Theo, but I will continue to call him the hacker. <laughs> um, and he's told that he needs to provide the code key to get the millions of dollars of bonds behind the vault that's located within the building. And it's all controlled by the computer. Takagi says that, what kind of terrorists are you? And Hans asks for the code again because we're not terrorists. I'm no. just not going to answer that though. And Takagi tells him like, even if I were to try and tell you there are too many codes, you'll never be able to get in. I don't know all of the codes. I only know one. And Hans then takes out his gun and says, I'm going to count to three and there won't be a fourth. <laughs> and so Joe continues to say, I don't know. You'll just have to kill me. And so Hans takes him by his word and he shoots him <laughs> right in the face. Which is such a gangster move. You know what I mean? Some people would have been like, no, he's just bluffing. And, and that's, no, it blows him away. Okay, wow. How are you going to get into this, this vault now? Like, right? <laughs> For a movie where we've got robbers slash terrorists taking people hostage, there's very little casualties. Yeah. 
with the exception of John McClain killing everyone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's the only one who really takes down many people, yeah. but everybody else, I think... There's no, There's only two casualties. There's only two casualties yeah. from the hostages yeah. themselves. John happens to have seen the whole thing because he was hiding underneath the table and then ends up making a noise, alerting the henchman that he is there. And so then they go out looking for him. Hans asks the hacker if he can crack the code and hacker says, of course, yeah. it's just going to take me like two hours. Yeah. <laughs> so John is praying that Argyle heard the shots. He's like, come on, Argyle, come on, Argyle, mm-hmm. come on, Argyle. Meanwhile, we cut to Argyle and he is calling his latest booty call. He's like, I don't know how long I'll be, but I'll be there soon. I yeah. swear. <laughs> He's like listening, blasting music and stuff like that. And he's partying yeah. with the bear. Yeah. I mean, even if they, there were fire, mm-hmm. like they're on the 30th floor. Mm-hmm. And he's like in a parking garage, like right. deep he on the ground. Like, yeah, like he's not going to hear anything, actually. Like, you know what I mean? Like, my whole thing is like, why didn't like anybody else hear the fire? Because it was funny. It was like, right when they started shooting things, mm-hmm. John McClane looks out his window mm-hmm. and sees this girl like in an apartment adjacent yes, to the yeah, building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm sitting here looking at this and then I'm like, every time they do a wide shot and I'm like, there's no purpose near this. And they make it seem like it's just like literally <laughs> across the street. And I'm like, I don't see any other buildings across. He was like, almost like, I'm going to get the attention to that girl across there. Right. But no, she's just standing there in her underwear just like <laughs> for the sake of it. Like, and I'm just, it, I don't know. It's just, for me, I, you know, there's a lot of plot holes in here. Yeah. And you see a lot yeah. of things in there where I'm like, you know, you're having a huge gun battle right. on the roof, like of a roof. building. It's just machine guns. Like, in the middle of LA. In the middle of LA. Somebody's going to hear them, guys. There's something, if there, even if there's a homeless guy, like, what's yeah. going up there? <laughs> yes, like, but do you think the LA police are going to take the word of a homeless man? <laughs> that's, that's true, especially like, on Christmas Eve. Like, <laughs> exactly. They're just going to think that he's drugged out or drunk. Yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> they, people, the police are not kind to, yeah. to homeless people. So, Hacker gives. Hans an estimation of the time that he needs to crack the code and claims that the seventh code, because there are a total of seven codes to get into this vault, Mm -hmm. is completely out of his hands, though. It's not something that he can control from the computer alone, and that the specific, the seventh lock has a specific seal that can't be cut locally. Mm -hmm. Now we know that there's going to be something that comes later on to make sure that seventh lock unseals. Mm -hmm. Back to John. He does a lot of talking to himself throughout this movie. And so we see him talking to himself. And this is where he decides to pull the fire alarm to which the front desk henchman calls 911 and tells them to cancel the alarm. Mm -hmm. It's just a false alarm. Sorry about that. And John watches the cops and the ambulance drive down the street towards them only to see them turn turn off their sirens and pull a U-turn. And he's like, fuck. (laughs) So... Just as John is watching this, another henchman comes up behind him and tries to uh, draw John out of hiding. I just love how, like, this whole scene plays out because he's just like, I won't hurt you. And then immediately (laughs) shoots the gun. And it's like, that could have been a woman. It could have been a kid. Like, you know what I mean? He's just like, I won't hurt you. Cocks the gun. (laughs) Oh, he's not there. Like, (laughs) sorry about that. Hey, I I wasn't going to shoot you, actually, after all. Sorry, that was misfire. 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 That's not going to make me come out at all now. Like, <laughs> So the henchman follows the sound of a saw, and this is when John pulls the gun on him. John jumps on his back and then creates major constructional damage as yep. they fight, mm-hmm. and the two tumble all the way down the stairs, and somehow John is completely fine, but yeah. the henchman has broken his neck, yep. even though they tumbled together. <laughs> John just was trained better to take a fall like <laughs> it, there is an art to yeah, falling yeah. there is an art i have not mastered it yet <laughs> <laughs> so the hacker gets through lock number one at this point in time and john rifles through the henchman henchman's bag and he grabs several of the guns and a walkie and he checks his id um, and he sees that it's a fake id john tries to take off his shoes and realizes that the henchman even though the henchman's like a foot taller than him yeah. has like smaller feet than he does yeah. So he has to continue barefoot. John gets to the ele- elevator and secures it to the 32nd floor. And this is where he sends the dead henchman down to the floor of the party with a sign that says, come and get me, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> one down, I think is what he said. No, like says, that. now I have a machine gun. Po, oh, po, that's po. the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Po, po, po. I love and that. Then, I, and then Hans is like reading it and he's like, po, po, po. 
<laughs> He's very confused. He's like, oh, huh? what is this? Oh, right. I'm robbing a place on Christmas. I'm like, <laughs> yes, because the giant Christmas tree was not yeah, yeah. away. Because yeah. <laughs> he's just like that whole statement of like the confusion of it. Like he's wearing the Santa, like he puts the Santa Claus hat. Now I have a machine gun. Pull, pull, pull. Like he's confused. Like I don't know. If See, you like, even like, have Santa. Yeah, you, you have, have Santa. Santa. Yeah, there's Santa. Right this there. is definitely a Christmas yeah. movie. Yeah. John is on top of the elevator and he's taking down the names of the henchmen and writing them on his arm mm -hmm. so that way he can keep track of everybody. And we see that Carl, one of the henchmen, wants blood because John inevitably killed his brother. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Hans says, we're not changing the plan. No matter what, the plan must stay. Yeah. We don't know exactly what that is yet, yeah. but it's coming. Ellis, being the complete tool that he is, tells Holly that John's going to fuck everything up. <laughs> it's almost as if he's in on it. Too. Yeah, really. <laughs> John reaches the roof. He uses the walkie-talkie that he's stolen from the henchman to call out to 911. Apparently, everybody uses the exact same channel. John and the terrorists are all on the same channel as the 911 operator. So why it's taken the 911 operators to find out? That's for, what I'm wondering. Like, I'm like, are they switching? Are they pushing? Because there's certain some things, some things where I'm like, when I was rewatching, I'm like, okay, so he's just talking to Al. You're telling me Hans is not listening right. to what you're saying. Like, you're like, mm -hmm. Let me interject here and just be like, right. you're not, nothing's going to happen. Like, you know why I mean? didn't they say, meet me on channel 10? Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? So I don't know if they're like, if Hans is just constantly switching through and listening, but it's, I don't know. I, I don't know how those walkies work. Because I don't uh, I'm like, <laughs> but Hans and all the henchmen hear John call out to 911. Yeah. Uh -huh. So it's, I'm so confused. Yeah, me, yeah, I know. And then, yeah, and Al and them are on the same frequent police channel frequency. I don't know if like, John's just like swapping back and forth. Like, I don't know. It's just it doesn't a weird make any thing. sense. Yeah. But anyway, so he calls Mayday. We have terrorists with semi-automatic guns. Mm -hmm. And then, as I mentioned, the henchmen here and they head to the roof. Mm -hmm. And the 911 operator is extremely unhelpful yeah. and says, excuse me, if this is a prank and he's, I don't fucking care. Yeah. Send a black and white. Yeah. <laughs> so they send out Al. He is at the convenience store buying some snacks for his very pregnant wife and they radio him and he's like okay well i'll go check it out and so he goes over to the nakagami <laughs> building and we cut back to john on the roof and he's getting shot at every turn <laughs> so john shoots off a door lock mm -hmm. and finds his way back inside and from here he makes his way through a very large art air duct which is iconic for action movies to yep. be caught in the air ducts and then he's inside of the elevator shaft as well and so he's trying to get away and this is where he has a, a bit of a fall mm -hmm. and somehow manages to grasp onto one of the elevator ledges and pulls himself up yeah so he's now on a different floor i can't even tell you how many floors he goes to i think he yeah. goes to every floor from 30 to, touch, to 35 yeah. <laughs> he has to he has to touch every single floor like so the henchman says that he's in the elevator sh uh, shaft and Han says, perfect, he's trapped now and they can get back to what they're doing. So the henchmen go running to find the air shaft and begin putting holes in it like Swiss cheese. Mm -hmm. Somehow they miss him. Yeah. Iconic action movie thing. But John can see the henchman through the vent and prepares his gun. Right before henchman number one is right beneath him, he gets called away though. So John's not able to take him out right at this moment. So John makes it back to the office where they killed Tagagi, and he sees that there's a police car down below, and the police, the cop decides to go inside and talk to the lobby henchman. The lobby henchman comes out and uses a very southern accent to say, sorry, it's another false alarm. There's a bug in the system. So Al comes inside to see there's nothing out of the ordinary here, and John is up probably on the 33rd floor, trying so desperately to get his attention. He's banging on this window, which makes no sense because yeah. he can't hear you. Mm -hmm. But John then very smartly goes and grabs a chair to smash straight through the window. But this has alerted the henchmen around. And so the henchmen comes up behind and they all begin to engage in some firefight. <laughs> Al decides nothing looks am amiss here. So he heads out. Meanwhile, John has now successfully killed two henchmen and has the idea, I'm going to launch one of these bodies down onto the car. That'll get his attention. And how much force did he have to literally <laughs> propel this body to crash the window and then go maybe 10 or 20 feet out right. to where it hit the car as he's backing out? So, like, the building is probably has about 
tw- 20 feet already mm-hmm. like you know what i mean Be- yeah between the car. so he has to like launch it like <laughs> you know i don't know the physics <laughs> of it have to have really good yeah aim. like he just john is very strong <laughs> at this point like you know what i mean like i don't know i'm so. trying to decide is it like disc throwing did he have to like spin yeah, around spin and, around and, and, and man, toss like, it yeah i don't know what it is you know I, what we only see one henchman's body land yeah. i'm sure he tried with the first <laughs> one and missed yeah, exactly <laughs> so he had to take the second one and yeah. launch it again he's like second time's a charm yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's funny there's no continuity issue in this too because when the car starts to back up they still have the body on the police car yes and then like you see his car hit a bump <laughs> and, the, and the body literally right. pops off the hood and flies across the yard and then it goes <laughs> and then he continues like backing away from all of the fire mm-hmm. so yeah it's pretty funny it's so good yeah so this has gotten Al's attention and he calls back to the station and he is panicked to say the least and says, I need the cavalry. <laughs> Hans knows that all of this is happening and he says, don't worry about this. This is all part of the plan. Everything's going to be fine. And John then takes the opportunity to call Hans on the walkie talkie. So he reads off the names of the henchmen that he's killed so far mm-hmm. And Hans then takes a guess that John is probably a security guard. <laughs> and John re- uh, replies in a very game show fashion, eh, wrong. <laughs> so now Hans is like, all right, what are you guys standing around here for? Go find this motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> so Hans asks, who are you? And John replies that he's always been partial to Roy Rogers. And he says the iconic line. Yippee ki motherfucker. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> Back at the news station, one of the reporters, who is the bad guy from Ghostbusters. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the EPA. He hears about this incident, and he thinks it's an imperative story, and it needs to be heard. But the producers are waving it off yeah. until later. Yeah. Then they realize it's yeah. a problem. So later on, the henchmen are returning to, to Han, saying that John wasn't lying, that they, he really did kill all these people. Hans kills, uh, calls over to the hacker and says, we have a problem. And the hacker replies, we got three out of the four down. We're on our way. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Cops are calling back on the radio. John reports out everything that he knows to them. And all of the henchmen are listening in because they haven't figured out how to get to a different channel. <laughs> Al asks John, what do I call you? And because John is at least smart enough to know that the henchmen are listening, yep. He says, "My name. you can call me Roy, an homage to Roy Rogers. <laughs> so Al tells him to find a safe space and to let the police do their job, which is hilarious yeah. because they don't. But anyway, this is when the assistant chief shows up and he asks what's happening. And so Al tells him that he's been talking to this guy who phoned it in and that he thinks he's a cop. But the assistant chief doesn't believe that this is a good idea. He's, he's probably just one of the terrorists pretending. And Al's no, I feel it in my gut. I know this guy. Mm-hmm. He is just like me. He is a cop through and through. Yeah. <laughs> so we cut back to Hans and Holly has walked in. And she, I love Holly. Mm-hmm. She is so take charge. She's like, all right, you got guns. You don't scare me. Yeah. It's fine. You're not gonna kill me. <laughs> <laughs> so Hans asks her, "Who put you in charge?" And she says, "You did. You killed my boss." Yeah. <laughs> and it's just the look on his face too when mm-hmm. she said that line, like, "You did." And he's like, "Oh, well." He's like, did "What did I do?" Yeah. What did I? When did I do that? <laughs> That's not part of the plan. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, I try to think about it. Like, if John wasn't at the party, mm-hmm. what would have been the plan? Would they have just called it in themselves to be like, "Hey, we right. taking control of this building. Like, send somebody." Like, you know what I mean? Like. Would they have gotten the same uh, like response or like mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Or would it have taken the, the same like kind of structure like where like I don't know it just yeah I, I'm trying to think yeah. of what the plan was to get the FBI because that was the whole mm-hmm. game plan. That was the whole the thing. Was the yeah. FBI there? But it's okay if John wasn't there, then what would would have been your stages to even get the FBI there? Because yeah. you didn't really announce like you announced yourself to them. Mm-hmm. But how would you have let the world know that you were there? <laughs> well, I think that's where the idea that they're playing off as terrorists when they're really robbers yeah, yeah. come in. And that's why, like, the police are super confused. They know them as terrorists, but they're yeah. like, why haven't they called in for, like, negotiations yeah. or anything like that? But Hans is, okay, we only have three out of the four locks unlocked. We need to wait until we at least hit the fifth lock. Yeah. <laughs> before we call in. And the... then they shut down the building. So 
she starts negotiating. She says, we've got a pregnant woman out here. Can we get some needs? We've got people who need to use the bathroom unless you want it to get really messy out there. Yeah. And Hans is a very cordial mm-hmm. robber slash terrorist. He's like, okay, sure. You guys can have whatever you need. <laughs> right? He understands yeah. human dignity. Yes, exactly. <laughs> in a sense. <laughs> and she tells him that her name is Miss Gennaro. We cut to Argyle continuing to party it up in the limo. And this is where he finally turns on the news and sees that the newscaster is reporting out the situation at hand. Yeah. And he still doesn't really do a whole lot. But to be fair, what do you really do in that situation? Exactly. It's funny because he's driving around in this thing, trying to look for an exit. Oh, yeah. And it's completely locked down. It's completely locked down. And he knows the building is overran with terrorists at this point. But at the end of the movie, he decides he's going to drive through the gate. Yeah. And I'm like, why didn't he just do that in the first place? I would have just, I'm out of here. Boosh. <laughs> I think he just didn't have that sense of urgency yet. Yeah. He was like, all right, as long as they're not near me, yeah. I'm fine. Yeah, so I'm just going to wait it out. Yeah. I mean, I would have at that point. I'm like, <laughs> they didn't see me at this point. I would have just been like, skirt. Park skirt, it. skirt. Yeah. Yeah. For real. <laughs> Man. So the cops send in a group of cops. And of course, because they're all on the same fucking frequency. Mm-hmm. Hans hears all about this. They all know, and they have cameras pointed to where all the cops are coming in so they can anticipate and shoot them out. But Al asks the chief, what about the hostages? And the chief says, there have not been any demands yet, so we don't even think that there are hostages. They all think it's just a big ruse. Mm -hmm. Hans sees all of this, and he tells all of his henchmen to be ready. So we've got our lobby henchmen starting to lock all the doors, but also get all the firearms. And we've got two henchmen with a machine gun setting up in the lobby the hacker tells all the henchmen the status of when the the police are coming in and he starts this off by saying twas the night before christmas (laughs) oh yeah (laughs) so they're even quoting yeah christmas carols and movies (laughs) shots start to fire from the building towards the lights Mm -hmm. because the police have come in with giant lights and al is trying to tell the assistant chief They're shooting out the lights. The chief's not listening. And then they do shoot out the lights. And he's like, fuck. (laughs) So the cops send in this armored vehicle of some sort. Mm -hmm. And John is watching this, all of this unfold. And he hears the henchmen in the elevator. So we've got a group of henchmen who are taking care of the cops. We've got a group of henchmen who are trying to take care of John. And when the henchmen find out that there's an armored vehicle, that's when they truly bring out the big guns. Mm -hmm. They get a bazooka. Yeah, like RPG ish thing, like, and it's mounted into the ground and just like on a swivel thing. Yes. And it's like, how did they set this thing up? And it's just like, I, I'm like, where did you guys get all this firepower? Uh, exactly. I can't even recall how many like guns they went through. Oh, like, yeah. So they it, were just, I don't remember them bringing that much stuff in. Like, right. They, just, they had so much artillery. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was just ridiculous. Hans tells the henchman, hit it again. To, to shoot the armored vehicle mm-hmm. and john tells him stop you've made your point but hans has decided to continue on and john has taken c4 mm-hmm. from some of the henchmen mm-hmm. and very smartly or very dumbly mm-hmm. opens up the elevator door sees that there's absolutely no elevator there and he packs all of the c4 onto an office chair and sends it straight down the elevator shaft blowing up the basement entirely yeah just <laughs> one of the things i'm just like man c4 does that more much damage. i mean it literally yeah. blows the windows out of a whole floor and it's just like <laughs> and then the fire is coming up at him but the building flying. is still standing yeah but the building is still standing at still at this point and it's just like, so ridiculously like one little brick of c4 mm-hmm. created so much havoc where i was just like i that- wonder if mythbusters ever took that on because they yeah. did a lot with c4 yeah but they should do a die hard i mean like there's a lot of things that are over exaggerated like i mean like mm-hmm. people like movies that do like frag grenades and it like right. this huge explosion i'm like i've thrown frag grenades before they don't do that <laughs> like they don't make this big ball of like <laughs> like you're like whoa because it's, like that's one of the things they were like they teach you in the military is that because you want to see it too because you're right. like you've been you're so programmed in movies where you like toss this thing and you're like mm-hmm. wanting to see this big explosion but it's <laughs> not that it's literally like you sit there well they first they throw you in the ground so you don't look at it because there's shrapnel that comes out of right. it right but they do have this this 
viewing station where you get to see other people throw it. So you, you, yeah, so you go up to the viewing station, they're like, don't worry, you'll be able to see it. And then you go up there and they throw it and it's just like a dust cloud. It's like, yeah. It's like it, yeah, yeah, it's like, and I'm like, <laughs> cool. All right. You know what I mean? It's not like, you know, nothing like flames and things like they're shown in the movie. Like everything that I saw in this movie, I'm just like, that's over exaggerated. That's over exaggerated. That's a nigga over exaggerated. It's like every single last explosion is over exaggerated. Sean McTiernan walked so michael bay could run yeah, yeah wow that's a, yeah exactly <laughs> michael bay stuff is just overly the, over the top over the top just, yeah <laughs> on the news they explain that hans gruber's background they say that he was actually let go from the terrorists mm -hmm. out in germany that <laughs> he was a little too out there for him <laughs> and this is where john calls out to al and the chief overhears this and is completely pissed mm -hmm. so al tells him hang in there we're back to the henchman group and Ellis has decided to take more coke and be a class A dick. He's like, don't worry. I got this. He did a your, courage ball. Your husband is going to get us killed. I'm going to go ahead and negotiate us out of this because yeah. I'm an excellent salesman yeah. who's been coked up for a long time yeah, now. For real. I just can't imagine like that much coke throughout the night to where I'm surprised he didn't do it sooner. Right. Where he's just like, hey guys, like we all want the same thing. Like, you know, I want some to demo some key cut me in on it. You know what I mean? Like I yeah. Uh so Ellis is brought into the office to meet with Hans, and Hans is humoring Ellis through this. And um Ellis says, Look, Bubby, I'm your white knight. I can give you this guy who's fucking everything up for you. Meanwhile, we cut to John and Al talking in the walkie. They're talking about their kids mm -hmm. and this is where Hans hears all of this and says, how touching, Mr. McLean, uh -huh. because Ellis has handed him over. Mm -hmm. Hans then hands the walkie over to Ellis, and Ellis says to, to John, no one gets out until they talk to the police, and he needs to stop fucking everything up. And John asks, panicked, what have you told them? Mm -hmm. And luckily ellis is not a complete schmuck yeah but he has told them that they're very old friends and that john is ellis's guest yeah so he does try and protect holly in that yeah. right so john says put hans back on ellis you don't know what you're dealing with tell them you don't know me yeah at this point you're like telling me you don't know me i'm like if i'm listening to this as a terrorist i'm like okay, know, my right. man, you're not gonna now convince me that you don't know me at this point right you know what I mean? <laughs> well then the other part is ellis is dead one way or another yeah. john is telling him tell him you don't know me because i don't want them to kill you yeah but at the same rate it's like he's dead anyway yeah he, he's he, dead anyway yeah, he's exactly. blood in the water yeah. you know <laughs> so hans does in fact kill ellis and everybody who is a hostage hears this and panics so Hans is demanding to know where the detonators are. John is not telling him. He's like, oh, you know, I don't have any more. Or do I? Yeah. So the chief is completely pissed at this point, And he says that he's getting people killed. And Al says, no, he's trying his best. <laughs> but the chief continues to dismiss Al. Hans suddenly gets onto the walkie. And Hans starts to make his demands to the police finally. He says that he needs the following terrorists released throughout the world. There are like seven people in Northern Ireland, nine people in Quebec. I think there are some people in, e in Egypt. And the chief's like, I don't think I have the authority to do that. And yeah. Hans is like, we'll figure it out. Meanwhile, he turns to his henchman and says, I saw it in Forbes or on Times or something <laughs> like that. Like, this is just a wild goose chase yeah. for him. Hans tells his henchman, I don't even care if he does this or not. This was all just a ruse because I need them to come and cut the power. The FBI here. So he calls out to the hacker and he asks, how is it going? And Theo says, it's going to take a miracle. And Hans replies, well, Christmas time is the time of miracles. Mm -hmm. So once again, a Christmas movie. This is also now when the chief is alerted that the FBI have made it in. And we see the ever notorious Agent Johnson and Agent Johnson, <laughs> not related. Yeah. So the chief tries to tell them that he's in charge, but Agent Johnson number two says, not anymore. No. So Hans is going through the building trying to find John, and he actually does. But this is the point where Hans has the realization that he's not met John yet, and no. John has not met him. Mm -hmm. So he plays that he's one of the hostages that has somehow made an escape. Yeah. And he has a horrific california accent yeah it's not even really california i don't even know what it is 
but his name is Bill Clay. Bill Clay, yeah. So John yells at him, relax, I'm not going to hurt you, because he's, like, panicked. Yeah. Hans is a very good actor. Mm -hmm. And Hans says that he was looking for the roof, and John says, stay with me and you'll be safe. The chief tells the FBI what the situation is so far, back to John and Hans. He gives Hans a smoke, because throughout this entire movie, John is smoking. Mm -hmm. And he says that he's a cop from New York. Hans tells him that he's Bill Clay, and John asks if, he, if he's ever shot a gun and hands him a pistol. Mm -hmm. while, but John notices that there's a board with a list of names that mm -hmm. show Clay in his first name, not Bill. It's, it's like a W something, yeah. like Will Clay. Well, <laughs> Bill is Will. Oh, yeah, that is true. <laughs> so how, I, oh, my God, how do you have, oh, <laughs> plot holes. <in> my... <laughs> <laughs> but he did, he he notices that it's Clay, but it's like mm -hmm. two other additional letters that right. are not that. And then, so it's like, you know. Who knows? Like, that's what he fears. Like, oh, yeah, have you ever shot this gun? Here, check this out. You know? Yep. He hands him the gun. And then right as John walks past, Hans calls to his goons and has his gun trained on John's head. John, of course, being very smart, says, well, well, well. Yeah. There's no bullets in the gun. What's funny to me with those guns and anybody who has these guns would are like, oh, I got to drop one of them. John clearly took out the mag and right. like did stuff to it and then like just handed it back and handed it to him. There's no there's there's a weight difference in the guns. <laughs> you know what I mean? And for Hans to be this smart terrorist who's been in like a militia or whatever, mm -hmm. and to not and to get a gun to not be like check it and everything like that. And he's just like, All right. And then it's like, hold on, wait, there's no <laughs> magazine with bullets in this. Like, that right there is just like, hey man, you didn't give me a gun. You didn't give me any bullets. Right. But you know what I mean? I would have been like, John, you didn't give me any bullets. What do you want me to do? Would, right. So I don't know. Wow. <laughs> so just when Hans tries to shoot him, but there's no bullets in yeah. it, the elevator door dangs and the henchmen come out and they start shooting John as he ducks for cover. Yeah. Hans tells the henchman to shoot the glass because he realizes that John doesn't have any shoes on. Yeah. And for whatever reason, there are so many glass panels in this floor. Yeah. just And it's not even a complete floor yet. Yeah. So it's, it's weird that they would just like, all right, let's install the glass and everything <laughs> else is unfinished. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's not, you're never going to accidentally back into one of those yeah, glass yeah, exactly, panels yeah. while you're trying to put it's up like, a beam. I like, yeah, it's, I feel like that's the last thing you install. You know? <laughs> John makes an exit and the henchmen throw a flashbang, but they don't see John anywhere. And so they head out. Hans goes back to the, the hostages, and this is where Theo, the hacker, has called out and said that they've made it through lock number six and to get over there. John makes his escape into a bathroom. Al tells him, you know, we've all got a pool, a pool on you down yeah. here. And he's <laughs> like, buy me in, you know? Oh, yeah. What are my eyes? He's like, I look good. <laughs> John asks Al, like, about him being a cop. And Al says that he's no longer on the streets anymore because he had an accident. And at one point in time, he accidentally killed a 13 year old boy who happened to have a shot, like a shoot, a oh, water laser, gun. Yeah, shot. laser gun. Yeah, laser like gun. That, yeah. And so Al tells him that they can teach you how to be a cop, but they can't teach you how to live with a mistake. Yeah. And so John and Al are having this really sentimental rapport with one another. And then Al tells John that the FBI is calling the shots now. And that's not looking good for him, yeah. essentially. Hans is with the hacker, and they see that the FBI is trying to cut the power. And Hans is like, this is the plan the whole time. Because they have to cut the power to the building, that's how the seventh lock will become undone, yeah. essentially. Down on the ground, the FBI is telling them that you got to cut the power to the whole city grid. <laughs> that is the only way to cut the power to this building, is to cut the power for the whole city grid. Yeah. So the vault opens as they do this, and the hacker says, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. all to owe to Joey. Yeah. <laughs> so henchmen start pilfering through the vault, and Johnson is calling in for a fully armed air support. Hans calls out over the walkie-talkie saying that he wants to speak to the FBI, and Johnson tells him, we've done everything you've asked, and we're sending air support, and... Hans turns to his henchman and says, he played right into our hands. So the whole idea now is that they're going to send up the hostages onto the roof and blow up the roof right when the FBI get there because you can't walk out with just $600 million. You have to fake your own death. Yeah. And so by blowing up everybody, the FBI and everybody is going to think that 
the henchmen are all dead as well. Which I mean, they are. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Which is funny to me. Like, if you know, I wouldn't be sad. Like, if I was Han, I would be kind of relieved. I would be sad that I don't have the the manpower anymore. But Mm -hmm. I would also be kind of relieved because it's like now I get a bigger cut. Right. Because I don't have to share it with all these exactly. people getting blown away. Hey, thanks, John, for making my cut bigger. There's a big difference between 13 and like six. Yeah, six people, yeah, splitting. Six hundred yes. million dollars. Yeah, yeah, six hundred million dollars, yeah. <laughs> I was only making 20 million. Now I'm making 100 million. Exactly. <laughs> so John is in the bathroom picking glass out of his feet. And he's calling out to Al and says, I want you to find my wife. And I want you to tell her that I figured it out. I'm such a jerk and that I should have been more supportive. She's the best thing that ever happened to me. And I need you to tell her that I'm sorry. We cut to the asshole newscaster is at Holly's house and threatens her housekeeper with immigration if she doesn't let him talk to the kids. Extremely manipulative. Yeah, really. Because <laughs> who's not to say that he might just not go ahead and just call him, call her anyway? Especially right. now that Holly punched. Oh, that's, that's spoiler better. alert. Yeah, yeah. Later. Yeah. So anyway, John finds the explosives and tries to warn Al about it when he's facing the... But then he's suddenly facing the wrong end of a gun. John then is able to circumvent the gun and starts kicking the shit out of Carl, henchman number one. (laughs) On the TV, we see that the newscaster has successfully gotten into the house and is talking to Holly's daughter. And that's when Hans realizes that Holly is John's wife and he grabs hold of her and takes her hostage. John is getting his ass handed to him, but then he eventually gets the upper hand. Mm -hmm. We see both Johnsons in the helicopter. One of them says, we're expecting to lose about 25% of the hostages tops. And the other Johnson says, I can live with that. <laughs> I don't think that's what you want in no, a hostage right? negotiation. Yeah, I don't want to know that people are like, if I was ever in hostage, well, you're 20% of you guys can die, but you know, <laughs> it's just like, what? So Hans gathers up all of the henchmen with the hacker and Holly. Holly tells Hans, he's nothing more than a common thief. And my favorite line of this whole movie is Alan Rickman getting in her face saying, I'm an exceptional thief. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so John ends up wrapping the chain around Carl's neck and hangs him very much like Clayton in Tarzan. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so John eventually makes it to the roof and he asks where Holly is because he sees all of the hostages set up there and he grabs a gun and starts shooting the air, trying to get them to go downstairs because he knows that the whole building is wired to blow. Yeah. The FBI sees this and they think that he's a terrorist. And so they begin shooting him and he's like, I'm a, I'm one of you guys, yeah. you assholes. <laughs> so he knows that it's a, uh, the building top is going to blow up. So he's trying to figure out how to get off of the roof and he sees a fire hose and wraps it around himself. He's like, I will never be on top of another skyscraper ever again. If I live through this. So he dive bombs off of the roof with the fire hose around his waist. Mm -hmm. And he then is able to escape the explosion, but then he has to figure out how to get back into the building. And so he's trying to break the glass of one of the other stories below, but he can't break it with his feet. So he takes his gun out. He shoots the window and he makes it onto the floor safe and sound until all of a sudden the fire hose is now dragging him down. (laughs) But then he unwraps it and he's fine now. Dude, this guy, like, in terms of glass, like, I feel like that type of paint, I'm like, how has this not sliced you, like, to bits? (laughs) Right? Oh, my gosh. So the whole building top explodes and with it, the helicopter with the FBI. Yeah. We cut to Argyle. In case you forgot that he existed, yeah. he is back in the garage and of the truck where the henchman came out of, he sees an ambulance drive out of the back. Which is funny to me. Argo, he doesn't know what's going on right mm-hmm. now. He's just observant of like, okay, he saw, he didn't even see the people come in. Right. But now he sees, I'm like, but this is his time. To he's gotten act. bored now. Yeah, now he's gotten bored. But I'm like, also, if I, if it was me, I'm like, why would I crash into this? Because you don't know who, like. You don't know how many people, like terrorists and mm-hmm. things there are, and you haven't been hearing about who's dead and who's not. So now you decide <laughs> you're going to act and run into this car. So what's stopping you from, like, in my mind, 20 or 30 more host- or terrorists coming, descending right. upon you right there? Then I would have just been like, do your thing, you know, keep going. Because it's like... <laughs> I'm going to stay out of it. Yeah, and it's like, because you don't know who's around the corner. You don't know what's going on. And it's like, 
oh, I see this band back out. It's just this one dude. And it's just like, <laughs> I'm going to de- decide. And I'm like, like, he, you have no weapon. I, I don't know. It was just weird. But... <laughs> to your point. Yeah. So the ambulance comes out of the back of the truck. Our guy gets smart and he gets into the front of the limo again. And he rams the driver's side mm-hmm. of this ambulance, which is being driven by Theo the hacker. Mm-hmm. And then Argyle gets out and he goes straight up to Theo and he punches him out in yeah. the face. He gives him one nice clean one. <laughs> oh, it's so good. Like strong punch too. Just like mm-hmm. one, like a clock. Like he must have been a boxer or something. Just like... It's funny because the guy who played Argyle, he was like, yeah, that fucking hurt. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, man, no. <laughs> so back to John. He calls out to Hans and he sees that Hans has a gun to Holly's head. Han says, you know, when you steal $6 million, they'll look for you unless they think that you're dead. John drops his gun and Hans replies back to him, yippee-ki-yay, motherfucker. (laughs) This is where John starts to laugh and then everybody else starts to laugh and that really awkward giggly kind of like, I'm laughing because you're laughing, but I don't understand Mm -hmm. what's funny. And then we see that John has another gun taped to his back. How did he do that? You know what? The way that his position, I don't understand, like, no, how he was able. Like, he would literally have to tape it in such a way, hold it, and then literally just, like. Right. Like, like trying to pat, yeah, pat, pat it. it down and, like, yeah. really get it. Like, it took, it probably took him, like, five minutes just to really At least. That. Yeah. <laughs> so just really get it. But not go over his shoulders. Yeah, but not go over his shoulders. Like, yeah, like, how much Make it tape? invisible. Yeah. Oh, man. So then. He shoots Hans and the other henchmen, and Hans crashes through the window, and he's grabbing hold of Holly's wrist. Mm-hmm. John runs over to Holly, and he's trying to work her free, and he finally does by removing the watch that she had received as a gift for landing this huge yeah. client, and Hans drops to his death. Yeah. You see this horrified look on Alan Rickman's face, mm-hmm. and that's because that is real. <laughs> Yeah, because see, they they dropped him without him really knowing or something like yeah. that. Yeah, like, so the stunt people they told they told Alan Rickman we're gonna drop you on the count of like, three, two, one, drop. Yeah. But to them, they're yeah. like, okay, you're actually gonna drop him on one. Yeah. <laughs> so three, two, drop. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so Alan wasn't expecting yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> and he dropped forty feet. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> yeah. That's a that's a pretty good mm-hmm. fall. <laughs> but he made it unscathed. Yeah. It looks good. It looks yeah. great. Yeah. And in an interview with Alan Rickman, he said, I made sure that was the last scene that I shot. <laughs> <laughs> so, John embraces Hallie, and we see outside the newscaster van that had gone to her house and interviewed her children has sped up. They wanted to make sure that they got back in time. And downstairs, all the hostages have made it out, including John and Holly. And they come out of the wreckage. And this is where we see the great love between John and Al be realized. Yeah. As they see each other, they see, oh, you're the one who I've been talking to this whole time. Yeah. And they embrace in a very loving hug. <laughs> and John cries in exasperation. He introduces Al to Holly and vice versa. And then the chief comes over and wants McLean to debrief what happened. And he's like, fuck you. I'm not yeah. doing jack shit. <laughs> All of a sudden, everybody starts screaming as we have one of the henchmen still alive, but not for long because Al takes him out. Yeah. This is where Argyle comes busting through those gates with the limo. Maybe when Al was about to point at him and then John was like, hey, whoa, 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 don't shoot at him. That's my guy. Oh, yeah, that's, that's my, right. That's yes, my yes, guy. Yes. That's my okay. dude. Yeah. Right, you're right. That's my guy. <laughs> John and Holly are walking towards the limo. And this is where the newscaster gets into their face and Holly punches them straight in the nose. John and Holly get into the limo and they kiss, ending the movie. End the movie, driving off. Yeah. That was a good movie. I mean, I, Great I, mean, movie. I, I love it. Uh, I just, you know, I'm, I'm wondering that all the hostages, or not mm-hmm. hostages, that all the terrorists get captured. I think so. I think they all died. I think that was the end. I feel like there was no, because the only terrorist that survived was oh, the hacker. Theo. 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 Yeah. Was the only, he was the only one who But he was it. down for the count. He's down for the count. <laughs> and it can be also said that because nobody really saw Theo. Yeah. He could have been like, I was just there. Like, I don't, they told, uh, what? I was one of the hostages. Yeah, I was one of the hostages. You know what I mean? Like, which, to have to... which nobody really went and checked on him. Mm-hmm. He could have actually woken up. Because, like, you know, 
Argyle didn't say anything to them. Hey, there's a guy down there. You know what I mean? Like, technically, Theo could have just woken up. Right. And just stumbled out. Because, I mean, he got <laughs> clocked. Yeah, yeah, like, it's just like, he could have literally just got a, one of the bags of billions and just like, walked out of there. Just like still. If anything, they should make that. Like, I feel like <laughs> Theo could have had a good clean exit still. Makes Theo's version of Catch Me If You Can. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so... Luckily, this very briefly barely passes the Bechtel test. When Holly is talking to her assistant, mm. she tells her, like, don't make me into a Scrooge. Go enjoy the holiday party. Mm. <laughs> like, mm. And then they talk about her pregnancy, too. Yeah. She's like, "How? How? when's your due date again? How yeah. far along are yeah, you? Yeah. She's like, oh, you know, I'm due, like, any day now. Yeah. My old baby could be tending the bar. You know? and yeah, I was just like, yeah, I was just funny. like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so some fun trivia. The fictional Nakatomi Plaza is the headquarters of the 20th Century Studios. So the studio could use one of its own buildings and it didn't have to hold back on any of the sense or action sequences. Cool. It was also, they gave them the top 30, like 30th floor and above because it was still under construction. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> so they put that into the script itself. The costume department had 17 different undershirts in various stages of degradation on hand for Bruce Willis. Mm -hmm. And in 2007, Bruce Willis donated John McClane's undershirt to the Smithsonian Museum. Yeah, because at one point, there, it's just like, that shirt is completely black. <laughs> and it makes sense. Like, you're yeah. literally you climbing. You shit you, up. You're blowing yeah. stuff up. You're full of blood, uh, glass and blood, and you're crawling through an air duct. Your car, your clothes should be filthy at this yep. point. You know what I mean? You're going <laughs> to need to bathe for like three days straight. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> And it's so funny because Holly just embraces him at the end. I'm just like, oh my God, you covered it. <laughs> They're all... bloody and gross yeah. afterwards. He's covered in a lot of people's blood. <laughs> yeah, you know, covered in Hitchman blood. It's just, he's just whatever. That's so funny. Oh my gosh. The scene where Bruce Willis and Alan Rickman meet up it was unrehearsed to create a greater feeling of spontaneity between the two actors. Mm -hmm. When Ella says, Hans, Bubby, that was completely ad libbed. And Alan Rickman's quizzical reaction was completely genuine. <laughs> Much of the script was improvised due to the constant screenplay tweaks that were being made during filming. So they had a script and then they had to completely rewrite it while filming was happening yeah. because they fired their screenwriter. Oh. And so they brought in a different screenwriter because he was supposed to make it funnier. Mm -hmm. And so he's trying to rewrite the scripts a week or two ahead of each of the, the scenes. The scenes. Yeah. <laughs> On... Alan Rickman's first day of shooting, he filmed a scene where Hans Gruber first runs into John McClane, and he jumped off a ledge that was about three feet high, and he injured himself when he landed. So he damaged some of the cartilage in his knee when he oh, did wow. this. And so the doctor told him not to put any weight on this leg. He had to use crutches for a few weeks. For the rest of the scenes in the movie where Hans Gruber is standing and talking to John McClane, Alan Rickman is actually only standing on one leg the whole time and has the leg brace on underneath his pants. Oh, wow. Hmm, interesting. Did not know that. <laughs> so we finally made it to the end yeah. on our caffeine scale, on a scale of one to five of special shots. Mm -hmm. How stimulated does Die Hard keep you? I think it's just, you know, <laughs> you're, it, I feel like you would have to be on five shots of espresso to even get to the <laughs> Bruce Willis seemed like he was on something that just, he was dealing with pain. I'm like, literally, I would have given up already. I mean, like, like, literally, you're falling from air ducts, you're jumping through glass, your feet is like, you know what I mean? You got yes. pain in your back. I'm just like... You're jumping off the building. You're jumping off the building, and I'm like, my man, like... <laughs> you're getting you, shot you're at like, left, right, and center. I, I, I almost wonder if he had taken a little bit of Ellis. I was going to say, you know what I mean? he just borrowed a bump. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just like, did you take some of his coke? Because you're just, like, all over the place right now, like... <laughs> You know, because from my understanding, I feel like you were just like super hungover and just doing a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, you were drinking and smoking the entire day. Now, does that speak to the power of nicotine? Oh, yeah, that's true. That's probably yeah, this he the smoked power. throughout the entire thing, yeah. too. While he was killing henchmen in between, mm -hmm. he was smoking. Smoking. <laughs> yeah, he was, doing, he was burning through a pack of cigarettes that night. So I completely concur. I believe this is a five. Yeah. It's such a romp. It's such a good movie to laugh to. The comedy and the action really work well together. And it's just so incredible. You've got Bruce Willis. You've got Alan Rickman. Both their first time doing film. Mm -hmm. And they're incredible at it. Yeah. And RIP Alan Rickman. Yeah. Forever in our hearts and souls. And Bruce Willis. He's now stopped acting. Yeah. Due to unforeseen circumstances. Yeah. But. They will dementia? forever, yeah, it's dementia, yeah. and but they will forever be memorialized in this film mm -hmm. and so many others. Yeah, 
for sure. Rich Phillips is in a lot of good movies that I like. Mm-hmm. So I love them. Love them. Well, thank you so much again, Parko, for doing this with me. Thank you for having me. I am very well caffeinated right now. <laughs> <laughs> and stimulated. And stimulated, <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. This is now the point where if you'd like to plug anything, I know you've had a couple of films. You mm. have a couple of events coming up, probably. Is there anything that you'd like yeah. to promote? Any of your films, social media, et cetera, et cetera? Um, I mean, you can uh, follow me over at Save the Airwaves. So that's my production company, uh, Parko Rich. That's my personal. Um, we got a few festivals that we've gotten into. We've got a, a new film called Superstar that we are uh, that will be shown at uh, Chandler Film Festival. Oh, cool. We just got the official selection for that. What's um, that? That Chandler Film Festival, I think, is like the third week of January, like oh, the okay. 19th-ish. So if you want to come see that and support film, um, get your tickets at Chandler Film Festival. Cool. And yeah, I'll make I, sure to link it in our bio. Oh, perfect. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's it. Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much again. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Thank you for listening to another episode of Caffeinated Flicks. We're a self-published podcast produced and edited by Kempy. We'd love to hear from you. Let us know what films you'd like us to cover, what we can do better, or just say hi. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can follow us on Instagram at Caffeinated Flicks Pod or email us at caffeinatedflicks at gmail.com. We'll catch you on the flick side.